Hi, my name is Lander Facchinetti, and in this video, I want to do a code review of the, my auto mixer, my own customized version of the auto mixer effect in Reaper. And this is interesting to cover in a code review because it has the three kinds of programming that you can do in Reaper. It is a JS effect that affects audio. It is also a video processor in the part that does auto mixing of video. So if you have a podcast with multiple cameras or a round table with multiple cameras, then you can switch between cameras based on who's speaking. And then it is also a rescript that automates some things inside Reaper. Namely, it automates the creation of the parent track and the routing of the channels to the parent track so that the auto mixer works. So it is a great example of how the different kinds of programming in Reaper can work together and create an effect that I, I think is very useful for editing podcasts and roundtable. If you don't know what the auto mixer is and how you can use it and how to set it up, then I suggest you watch the other videos in this channel that are linked below in the description in which I show you the effect and I give you examples and I... Um, play with it and I set it up and then you can understand everything that it's doing. In this video, we are going to go over the code for that. So yeah, let's uh, dive right in. Here is Reaper and I'm going to grab the auto mixer, drop it into a track so we can edit. And I'm going to start with the effects itself because I think it's the most interesting part. Then I will go over the video processor, though it's really short, it's just literally one line of code. And then finally, I will go over the rescript to set up the tracks. So if you are interested in just one of these three, then you may want to jump around in the video. Anyway, let's start with this part. First of all, I have a line that I don't think I have described this line in any of my other videos about JS effects, neither when I am talking about um, the, the, the simple audio effects I have already covered in this video, uh, in this channel, doing live coding and whatnot. I don't think I ever talked about this line. And this is super important. If you are releasing plugins for other people to use, this is the line that determines how the plugin will be called in the effects list. In fact, I don't have this line in any of my other plugins, so they all have just the path to the effect. Which I guess is kind of reasonable. I mean, you can use this and you know uh, by the name of the effect what it should be. So this line is kind of redundant, but if you don't want the whole path to show like that, then it's a better practice to have this line here. And there are more things you can describe here besides just the name of the effect. And some parts of the ecosystem will pick this up. For instance, you can have a change log here. And then if you're using repack to package this, there are ways for you to just take this, uh, the, the change log, the long form description and whatnot, and put that into the package. Anyway, next, I have here a comment that is just, if you open this effect and you have no idea what's going on and you click on edit, then you can trace back to where it came from. And of course, if you go to this link, then you can read more about this. Then I also have here a comment with the code that you need to paste into the video processor if you are doing auto mixing of video. And I thought it would be handy to have this since uh, if you just, you're setting things up, you can just come here and grab this code and paste it into a video processor. Now let's talk about the lines of code that are doing the sliders. And they may seem trivial, but there is already a trick here. And I showed this trick in a previous video. I think they are the oscilloscope. I showed how you can put a non-breaking space here. So it's not your regular space. On a Mac, I have to hold Option and hit Space. On a PC, I don't know how to do that, but definitely you can just come here to the code and copy and paste this character if you need. In any case, having a no-breaking character, no-breaking space here means that in the effect itself, this will show up as if it wasn't labeled at all. And that's the intent I, I have here. I have this field that is uh, self-describing. I don't need another label here. But if I don't put anything here, then Reaper won't show this at all. So that's a trick to enable bypassing. And I already have also in the oscilloscope and maybe some other effects, I don't remember, 
uh, a description of how, of how this works. This is kind of a slider, but not really. It shows up as a drop down, and you can select different options that are discrete. So it's not a slider that you can slide left and right. And then, of course, this sets a variable that is still a number. So each option corresponds to a number. So this is zero and this is one. Then I skip over, so there is no slider too. And the reason for that is that I want this small amount of space here between this text area or this drop down menu and these sliders. So by having a no slider too, I'm skipping over one of these and creates a space. Similar to what's happening here, there is already there is another space here, that's because I'm jumping from slider 5 to 20. So you can just jump as many sliders as you want. If you jump one or more, then it's going to create this space, which is good for grouping the sections of sliders. And then the sliders themselves, there is nothing special here, and you can go watch the other video in which I go over all of these parameters and what they do. We will also kind of have to mention that in this video as well, when we are actually using the variables, but for now we can skip that. Then there is another uh, trick going on on these lines. So these lines are sliders that I don't think most people are ever going to use. So I, I hide them from the user interface, but they are still available if you know where to dig. So you can see that there is no slider here named track gain maximum difference in DB. There is no slider with that name. The reason for that is that the name starts with a minus or a hyphen. When you do that, Reaper still allows you to have that slider. It's still available. It just doesn't show up here on the interface, but you can do anything you could with sliders using this slider as well. You can automate it. You can uh, come here to this ellipsis. No, not those ellipses, uh, param. Yeah, you can come here to param go on the effect parameter list and then showing track controls the, the the parameters are here they are hidden under my face let me get myself out of the way so yeah these parameters are still here and you can enable them and then they show up here on the track header and you can change them so they are parameters that are similar to any other parameter the difference is just that they are hidden and that's how you access them so i think that's a nice way to have the advanced configuration things, things that most people are never going to bother with. And I don't want to clutter the interface with those options, but I still want to give that option for the, the advanced users. And that's how I do it by hiding it here. And then there is something similar here. I have this setting for priority. And the idea here is simple. If you have multiple people and one of them or multiple people are moderators, then you can give them higher priority. And if multiple people are speaking, people with higher priority will be louder. And I want to have this for as many tracks as this plugin supports. This plugin supports 32 tracks because each track may be at least stereo. That's the least number of channels in a track, two. And Reaper allows you to have at most 64 channels in a track. So 64 divided by two is 32. So I have 32 priorities because I could have 32 tracks at most. But if I had all of these priorities showing up here, it again would clutter the interface. So what I did is I showed you four of them because I think that four is a pretty good number. So four microphones in a room. And let's suppose that at most four people would be moderators. So you would want to increase their priority of at most four microphones. So that's what you can do here in this interface. You can increase the priority of four people or decrease for that matter. You can like mute essentially a person by decreasing the priority to zero. You can see that it's muting here. This, this line that is indicating the gain went all the way down. But if you are advanced and you have a setting with more than four moderators or for whatever reason you need to change this, you can come here to the extended version of the parameters and you can find the priorities for up to 32 uh, microphones, up to 32 uh, tracks. Anyway, then I have some extra options here. The no meter we also used in the oscilloscope. The idea is just that I don't want to show meters here on the left and right, as usually happens in other kinds of JS effects like these meters. There is no need for them because I'm actually doing uh, meters here in this interface. So there is no need for them. I disable them 
And more importantly, I have this to set up a space of global memory. And this global memory is accessible by any instance of my plugin. In fact, it's access, you can access this even in other plugins if you need, as long as you declare this same name for the global memory. I'm putting here a name that is unique and describing my plugin. And any other plugin that for whatever reason wants to communicate with mine or even read values or even mess up with the operation of my plugin by writing on top of this, they could, in theory. I don't think that ever, anyone ever does this, but you could. The idea here is just that there is this block of memory that is global. Any plugin can access it. And I'm declaring it here because there is one information that I need to exchange between this plugin and the video processor part of the plugin. And that is what track is active. So the track that is active is in red here. And I want to do a setup with multiple tracks just so you have uh, a better notion of what's happening. So I'm going to close all this, delete this track and come up with, I guess, four. Uh, let's do four tracks. I'll select all of them and I will use the script that we will cover later in this code review and set up an auto mixer for four microphones. As you can see here, there are four microphones and then there is this channel, this track that is acting as the auto mixer for all four of them. And now you can see that there are four microphones here. The first one is active by default. And I want to communicate this to the video processor. So if there is another channel that is uh, louder than this red will change to the other channel. And I want to communicate this to the video processor so that it switches the camera to that person. So that's the only thing that I communicate over this global address space. So I'm, this is actually an array similar to JSFX arrays that we have covered already in the oscilloscope, in the RMS videos as well. So there is this big array that is uh, global, so anyone can access it. And I'm only using one slot. I'm only using GMEM of zero. And that's where I pass that information, where I pass the information that track one is active at this point. Okay, so now there is a block of code that runs on, uh, on the slider change or when I hit play and pause. There is a block of code that runs on every sample. There is a block of code that runs when you are serializing the information from this plugin. Uh, and there is a block of code that runs to, it runs about every, uh, it runs about 30 times per second. And it does the rendering of the user interface. So this part with the meters, not this part with the sliders, but this part with the meters. And we are going to talk about all of those. I'm going to start with one of probably the simplest which is this serialized portion. Because what it's doing is super simple. It's just storing one value in the project itself. So if you are using this in a project, then this value will be stored. And I'm not actually doing anything with this value yet. But the idea here is that you're storing this value and you can store any kind of value. You could store samples, you could store numbers and whatever. But then this block of code is kind of interesting because it runs twice. It runs first to store values. So when I say version is this value and a file var, this is storing in the file. So the project file, it's storing this information. But this block of code also runs when loading up the project or when loading up the plugin in the project. And when it does that, this block of code is not writing to the file, it's reading from the file. So this block runs twice with completely different meanings, opposite meanings. So when this is running in write mode, this means write to the project file. And when this is in read mode, it means read from the project file. And why am I doing this? Well, for two reasons. The first is a hack. And we covered this in previous videos in the RMS video and also in the oscilloscope video right before this one when I was fixing the oscilloscope. We need to run the slider section anytime you hit play for various reasons. That's something that I need to do. And I'll cover the slider section in a moment. But the point here is 
I need to run that section of code anytime you hit play. And Reaper was supposed to do that, but it doesn't in fact do that. I have no idea why, but it doesn't. But if you create a serialized section, then it does. And I have no idea why that happens, but that's the case. If you want your slider section to run on every, every time you hit play, then you need to have a serialized section and it could do nothing at all. It could be just an empty line, or really not an empty line, but it could be a nonsense line like this. That would work. But I'm actually doing something useful here. The thing I'm doing is I'm storing the version of the plugin. Because in the future, if I update something that is breaking the current version, so I need to change some internal uh, values that don't have a default on this version of the plugin, but then later they have a default and I want to do something with that. Or in any case, if I just want to check if the version that I am loading is the same as the one that is currently running. So maybe you save this project, close the project, update it, the auto mixer, and then you open the project again, I can detect that and I can react to it. That's not something that I currently do, but you have to set this up from the get-go if you want to be able to do this in the future. So I have here the version of the plugin, that's 1.1.1, and I'm storing that in the project file. So I'm actually using the serialized section that is kind of a hack, but I'm doing something useful with this. And this is a trick that I learned from reading someone else's JS effects. In particular, I was looking at this repository. So there is this library for building user interfaces in JS effects, and I'm not using this library, but I read over the documentation for it and there was this uh, idea here. So you can use this and then uh, you can react to version changes. And I'm, I picked up this trick from here. I'm not actually using this for anything right now, but it's a useful trick to have in place. Anyway, so let's talk about the slider section. This one right here. So there is just a bunch of initializations as you would expect from this section. First of all, the maximum number of tracks, as I mentioned before, is 64. That's the maximum number of channels in a track in Reaper. That's the most channels a track can have in Reaper. And I divide this number by two because that's the least number of channels in a track in Reaper. So that's the maximum number of tracks you could have in the auto mixer. That's the most the auto mixer can handle. If you have more than 32 microphones, the auto mixer will still be able to work with this, but you'll need to have multiple instances of the auto mixer and mix 32 microphones at a time and then mix the result of those. So you would need a hierarchy with a tree of auto mixers. That would be weird. But in any case, it's something you can do. And that's so that's the, uh, the maximum number of tracks. If I inspect this, you'll see that it's 32 tracks, and that's why we have 32 of these sliders, for instance. Next, I want to check how many tracks you are actually using. So I divide the number of channels that currently exist in the track. So for instance, this track that we have in our example is an eight track, eight channel track. So I divide this number of channels that currently is eight. I can peek at the variable and see that it's eight. And divide by the number of channels per track, which is one of these sliders. So if you have microphones here that are not stereo or tracks here that are not stereo, but multi-channel, suppose you had a track with 10 channels, you could have that. Then you can come here to this slider and increase this so to say that each track has 10 channels. That's unusual, but something you can do. And then that's the number of tracks that I'm currently working with. In this case, I have number of channels. We saw that that was eight channels per track. By default is two, so there are four tracks. And I can peek at this variable and check that it's actually four. Now, we will compute RMS. That's the core of the plugin. And to compute RMS, to, to understand how and why and different ways to do this, I recommend that you watch the other videos in this channel that are four videos about RMS and I cover everything you want to know about it. For this, just know that we are computing with the optimized version, which is not an approximation. It is really computing RMS correctly, not using the exponential moving average that we saw in the other videos. It's computing with the optimized version. 
So I need to have a window. I will need to do some um, running sums and keeping track of that. But the important thing is I, the, the auto mixer needs to know how much each microphone is contributing to the mix. And to do that, it's computing RMS. And here I let you change the size of the window in terms of milliseconds. A uh, window that is shorter will react faster, so the sliders here with the gain will go up and down more rapidly. And if I make the window longer, then it takes more time for the sliders to change. These sliders that represent the gain, they take more time to change. It's as if the mixing engineer at the table is doing the movements more slowly, or the sliders have more drag, more weight to them. And I need to convert this to the number of samples in the window. This is similar to what we had on the RMS plugins that we wrote in the in the RMS plugin. It's just one that we developed in the other videos. But the idea here is just that I'm taking the no, the sample rate, which in my case is forty eight thousand samples per second, and multiplying by three hundred milliseconds. I guess is the default, and that's the one we have here. So 300 milliseconds divided by a thousand. And that is going to give us 0 0.3 millisecond, 0 0.3 seconds multiplied by 40,000 samples per second is going to give me a number that is, uh, it may be uh, a non-integer, but there is no, there isn't a concept of a half sample. So I will take the ceiling of that. And if you decided to go with a window of size zero, and I allow you to do that because it kind of doesn't make a lot of sense, but in Recomp, the compressor that comes with Reaper, there is a similar field here, RMS size, and they allow you to go to zero. So that's why I decided to allow you to go to zero as well. If you go to zero, then this multiplication will be uh, zero. So this whole value will be zero, but I don't want to have a window of zero samples. So I'm saying the maximum between one and whatever you selected. And this guarantees that if this the window is zero, then it's actually one. And that's a trick that you can use to limit values when you have a slider that doesn't make a lot of sense, or even if you want to prevent failures that could happen if the user just typed in a value, which is something they can do. They can come here and type in minus 100, and Reaper is going to respect that. This RMS size in milliseconds now, when I peak, is minus 100. So if you want to prevent this from causing failures in your plugin, you can use this trick of applying the maximum or minimum if the limit is an upper limit. So in effect, this is similar to what you would have in a limiter. And we have developed a hard clipper, a kind of limiter, in a previous video. So you can go check that one as well. It's uh, the... It's a video called like seven or nine effects as fast as I can or something like that. Anyway, now we'll need a pointer, a counter that wraps around in the circular buffer that is a window for co computing RMS. If this doesn't make sense to you, then you should pause and go watch the other videos about RMS. But this is the, the pointer that will loop around in the circular buffer. And then there are two values here that have to do with the computation of um, the track that is currently loudest. So in this case here, the track that would be red. And then I don't know why there is no tracking red here. Maybe because there is no sound coming through at all. So maybe what I could do is come here to the master. I don't want to hear anything for now, but I can enable this for recording and then we should be able to hear this in input three. That's my microphone. Okay, so now it's red. And that's for, again, the benefit of the video processor. So we'll have two values here that we'll use later, but they are given to by the user in terms of dB, and we want to convert that to amplitude, and they are given in terms of milliseconds. We want to convert that to samples. This conversion, this second one, is exactly equivalent to this one. And this is something that we covered in very much detail 
in the other video about Gain, the simplest plugin you can write. I think that's the name of the video, the simplest plugin you can write. And I mentioned there how this formula works. I explained why you do it like this to convert from dB to amplitude. I also explained how to convert from amplitude to dB using the converse of this formula. Now there is the section that does memory allocation. This is taking that big array of slots that JS effects give you and it's partitioning, it's taking chunks and giving it different names so that we can actually make sense and use this properly. And this allocation mechanism is something that we used when doing the um, multi-channel RMS, so the fourth video in the RMS series. Also, we did something similar when doing the multi-channel oscilloscope, which is one of the previous videos. The way this works is, it starts an address that will be the next available address, it starts with zero, and then we are allocating a, an array that is the track's priorities. This array is not really necessary because all it's doing is storing the information from the slider. So the track priorities are set by the user using the sliders, but using the sliders directly is annoying because you would need to say, oh, I want slider 33 or I want slider 41. In your code, that doesn't read as nice. So what I do here is I just copy the values from the sliders into the array, the tracks priorities array, and then the code later will read as tracks priorities for track 17. That reads a lot better. So, and, and because this is so small, it's like 32 positions in an array that has 8 million slots, it's not a big deal to pay the price of storing a bunch of extra memory and accessing a bunch of extra memory just for the benefit of readability. Speaking of readability, I want to take an aside. When I'm naming these sliders, I'm trying to give them names that, so that the user can make sense of these sliders. So usually, for instance, in something like Recomp. So in something like Recomp, the name of the slider is RMS size. And if you know what RMS size is, then good for you. And if you're watching this, you probably know. But some users may find this name not descriptive at all. So when, when I developed this, I tried to give the labels meaningful names like reaction time. And now this makes more sense. You, you know that it has to react to different microphones being louder or quieter. So this is how much, how long it takes for the, the, the reaction to occur. I think that's more meaningful. And of course, I am going to give you the uh, unit of measurement here. So then I am going to give you the full explanation of what's going on. It's the RMS size in milliseconds. But I think it's nice to give people names that make more sense than just RMS size because people may not even know what RMS is and why that matters and may not care about how your plugin is doing the measurement of loudness. They just care that when doing this, it would affect the reaction time. And then maybe they can play with the slider and they will realize that, well, when I go to the right, then it moves more slowly. Okay, I can work with that. Anyway, so that's that. So the track's priority is, is given an address that currently is zero, and then I increment the address with the size of the track's priority. So this track's priority is an array of track's maximum slots. That's 32, we computed that here. So we want an array of 32 positions and that's how I'm doing this. I'm always saying address and then incrementing the address. I do address and increment the address. And here as well. And here as well. I'm always... Uh, the, and then by the end, the address is always the position of the next available slot in the array. To initialize this tracks priorities array, I loop over all the tracks and that's a setup to do the looping. It starts with track zero because it starts with minus one and immediately adds one. And then it loops over that many times, always adding one. And then I initialize the tracks priority with the slider 33 plus the number of the tracks. So 33 plus zero to begin with will be slider 33. And then we'll do this 32 times. So by the end track will be 31. And then 
33 plus 31, 64, and you end up with slider 64. Great. Now, there are a bunch more initializations here that have to do with the computation of RMS and other related things. I will not explain each variable now because we will use the variables later and it will make more sense when we go over that. So when we are doing the sample here, which we'll do right next, when I'm talking about the sample block, I will go over, I will go over what these variables all mean from track squares to... Uh, tracks RMS gained. But I do want to mention something. They are being initialized in much the same way. I'm always initializing with address and incrementing the address. And in some cases, I am initializing uh, what is not an array, but an array of arrays. So it's effectively a matrix or a two-dimensional array. Then, uh, And I need that because I'm tra taking, I'm tracking the squares of the samples. And that's for the computation of RMS. So I'm taking uh, I'm taking note of the squares of the samples as they come in. Or as the samples come in, I square them and I take note of that. And I need to do that for each track independently. So I'll have one array of squares of samples per track. I have 32 tracks. At most, I, it depends, right? It actually, it's actually this number. So for now, for instance, I have four tracks. So I want an array that has four positions and each position points to another array, a circular buffer, that is the size that the user set and that I will loop over using this pointer. So what I'm doing here is, first I allocate tracks squares and that is the number of tracks, so in this case four. It is an array with four slots. But then for each one of these slots, I'm looping over and initializing that variable. Much in the same way that I initialized variable, a variable here, I am initializing a variable here as well. But when initializing it, I'm again using the trick of allocating some address by assigning address and then adding to address with the size of the window. So now I'm, I have an array in which each position is another array. And this allows me to write code later that will read like, well, I guess the best way for me to do that is command F and then, yep, yeah, it will read like this. Very natural in a way that you access the track square by track and then by the pointer in the circular buffer. And that is a, a kind of a coding style I developed for allocating two-dimensional arrays, and of course, if I needed, I could have mm, even more dimensions by just coming here to this line and looping yet again, and I could initialize each track, each track squares on a given track, on a given position, to yet another array if I needed. Okay, and then there is one more thing that I need to cover that is different, and that's this line. This line, or this command, is just initializing the array to some number. And that's because I want to zero the values. Anytime you hit play, I want to zero the whole uh, history of the computation of RMS. I don't want to compute based on something that was before in the arrays. So I have my circular buffer that I'm using to compute RMS, and I may be playing some part of the project here, and then you may come here to this other part of the project and hit play. I don't want whatever, is what whatever was happening here to affect the RMS on this part. So I always zero and empty out the, the whole array space. And I'm doing that using memsat, which takes a base address, which is always my address here that I assigned. And then the value that I want to, to use to, to zero out, I could zero with like the number five, but I'm zeroing with actually this number zero. I'm initializing, I should say. I'm initializing with the number zero. And then that's for the length of the initialization. So I want to initialize this for always the same length as the array itself. And that's something that I do over and over. So here I have another array. It starts with address and I'm going to increment with the size of my array. So this is an array of four position in this case, but it could be a variable number of positions. I'm setting the address, so I am giving this base value. I am initializing with zero for exactly this size. 
And then I repeat this pattern when I, I, I initialize other variables as well. And then by the end, I communicate to Reaper that this is uh, the amount of memory that I'm using. So anything beyond that, Reaper is free to do other things with. And that is the first index that is available. So it's the current address because I have been adding to the address all along. So it's the current address plus one. And I like this pattern because it allows me to change the order of lines. If I wanted, I could do something like this. It wouldn't matter because I am always in a single line. I'm doing the whole initialization of one variable and I'm always using the address, but I'm always adding to the address and I'm always initializing that slot to some value. And sometimes that initialization is not desirable. And in that case, you just omit this part. For instance, in the oscilloscope, when we pause, that causes, the oscilloscope has a pause button that causes a slider section to run. But we don't want to zero out, we don't want to reinitialize this, the whole buffers because we want the thing to still show the wave when we pause. Hang on, I will show you that. So I'm going to come here to this, I will add the oscilloscope and I want this, when I pause, so I have my oscilloscope running here, I can hit pause, and I still want to see the waves. That's why I don't do a similar trick when doing initialization here. So I have, for instance, this part, I'm doing the address trick as well here, but I'm not, when allocating, I'm not doing a mem set here. I'm not doing that, and I don't want to do that. Okay, I'll get the oscilloscope out, auto mixer back in. That's the whole slider section, just a bunch of initializations. Now let's look at the sample block. And that of course runs for every sample. It's going to compute RMS. It's going to compute how much gain it should allocate for each microphone based on how much each microphone is contributing to the whole signal. And then it is going to do the actual uh, gain. So it's going to multiply samples by that size. It's also going to compute a bunch of things that are necessary for this user interface and for the video processor that goes along with the auto mixer. So let's start. First, I am manipulating that pointer in the circular buffer. That's something that we have been doing all along with the oscilloscope, RMS windows and whatnot. Then I am going to initialize this variable that is the sum of the tracks RMS. So I'm going to compute the RMS for each track, but I'm also going to compute the sum of the RMS for all tracks. The, and the reason why we need this has to do with how the auto mixer actually works. So let's explain, uh, uh, yeah, I'll do that now. I will explain to you the, the basic idea behind this. So I'm going to compute the RMS of each channel and I'm going to look at all of them together. So if I have, I don't know, um, this is very loud, but this is quieter. What I want to do is allocate more gain. I will leave this slider, which is similar to sliders in a mixer. So let me close this. Yeah, these sliders here are similar to these sliders here. They are defining the gain on each track. And I want the sliders to go up when the track is louder and go down when the track is quieter. So I am allocating more gain to the tracks that are louder. To do that, I need to know what is the total loudness of all the tracks. And then I will divide each track by the total. So if there is a number like 0 0.2, 0 0.3, I will add them up, 0 0.5, and then I will divide this, 0 0.2 divided by 0 0.5, 0 0.3 divided by 0 0.5, and that will determine the proportion, the ratio between the tracks, and that's what these sliders are going to become. So in summary, that's how the auto mixer works. It's a super simple algorithm. In fact, when developing this, the hardest part was figuring out how to compute RMS, and understanding how RMS works because it didn't want just to apply the formula but actually understand everything. But actually the algorithm for the auto mixer is that simple. It is just finding the proportion between 
the tracks and allocating the gain accordingly. Okay, so this starts with zero, the sum starts with zero, and we will increment which with each track. So we are going to loop over the tracks and we are going to increment the sum with the RMS that we are going to compute in this part. First, we will compute the square of the samples for all the channels in that track. Why do I compute the squares and why do I combine the channels this way? That has all been explained in the other videos about RMS. So what I'm doing here is just looping over all the channels, taking the samples on that channel, taking the square, and uh, yeah, I guess that's it. So I'm just taking the square of that sample, keeping it in the track square. So notice how I'm adding things up after squaring them and then divide by the number of channels in that track. So if I have in this case, two channels, and they are each a sample that is like, let's come down to the sample part. So yeah, the sample is something like 0.01. I will take the square of that and the sample one is 0.01 as well. I will add them up here in this accumulator that also starts with zero. So that's the number of, uh, that's the total. And then I divide by the number of channels, divide by two, and I will have a mean of the squares of the channels. Now I ha also have this running sum. So this running sum is, I have here in the array, I have this array that will update, it will be updated here, but it starts with zero as we saw. So we have this array that is the running sum and we kind of covered this already in the RMS videos as well. But now we have this other twist that we have an array because we need one per track. So this running sum, we will take the running sum, subtract whatever was there before. So we will subtract the old value, the one that is more than 300 milliseconds behind in time. So 300 milliseconds plus one sample, that's the old sample that we want to forget about. So I'm subtracting it. And then I'm adding the square that I just computed. And then finally, the RMS for that track is just that divided by the window size. And I'll take the square root of that. So this is the mean of the squares of all the samples in the window. That's the square root of the, that value. So that's the RMS of that track. Notice how I am also using a style here in which I define local variables for all the things I care about. And then later I will update all the arrays that are related to those variables. And that's just because sometimes there are some dependencies between the variables. So sometimes something like uh, some squares that is being defined here is affecting the RMS but and, and vice versa. So the simplest way to entangle that dependency is to not use, because I could, I guess, right? I could just come here to this part and copy and paste here. And in many cases, this would work because these are talking about the same value. And suppose that I have already updated this thing here, right? So in many cases, this works, but sometimes it doesn't because this variable depends on this one and vice versa. So the simplest way to untangle these kinds of dependencies is to define local variables and then later update all the arrays at once. So here, that's what I'm doing. I am updating the array on this position set that's on this track and on this. Um, so the circular buffer is going around in this position of the circular buffer. That's why I'm, uh, I'm keeping track of this square for this sample or yeah, so all the channels combined. And I need to keep track of this because I will need to subtract it when it gets too old. I will also update the track squares, the running squares. I'll also update the RMS and update the sum of the squares. So this part is doing the computation of RMS for all the tracks, for all the channels combined. Also taking the sum of all the squares. And that's going to be important for this next loop. What we are doing here is that division I talked about. We are going to see, oh, okay, this track is contributing one third of the gain of the total. This track is, com uh, is contributing one eighth of the total gain in all tracks. So this track will be um, 
it will we will allocate more gain to this first one because it is louder. To do that, we are going to loop over every track again. Now that we have the sum, we can look uh, we can loop over every track and do this division. So we are going to divide this current track by the sum of all tracks, and we are going to get a ratio. The sum of all tracks is always greater than this, right? Because this is actually one of the factors that went into computing that. So this is always a value that is smaller. So this number is always between zero and one. In this case that I only have signal in one track, this number here is probably the number one because that's the only track that has any signal in it. So the proportion is one. Uh, that's the whole track. But if there are two tracks competing, then this track could be half and this track could be half or this could be two thirds and one third and so on. That's what this part is giving me. Then I'm going to do some shenanigans here to implement the extra features, things like priorities and strength. Because if a track has higher priority, then I want to allocate more gain to it. And if the strength of the effect is greater or smaller, then that also affects the, um, the amount of gain that I'm going to allocate for that track. So that's what's happening here and here. Let's go over how this works. First, priorities. That's actually very simple. The priority is just a multiplication factor. So if, let's say that this track is contributing two thirds of the signal, then the priority for track one will be multiplied by two thirds. So in this case, it's multiplying by one, so it's not affecting anything, but I could change this to two. So let's say that the track is contributing two thirds and now it's two thirds times two. So it's actually four thirds, it's more than one. But that's okay because I am going to later normalize all the gains again. Because I'm doing these shenanigans with priorities and strength and whatnot, I will need to normalize all the gains. So I'll need to normalize these ratios again. That's why I'm computing the sum of all the gains so they can normalize. And by normalize, I mean something is very similar to what we did here. We calculated the sum of everything, the sum of all the RMSs, and then we divided each track RMS by the sum of all of them. We are going to do a similar thing here. We are calculating the sum of all the gains, so all the two thirds, one third, and so on, all the ratios. We are calculating the sum of all of them, and then we are going to do something similar. We are going to take all the, uh, for each track, we'll take the, the track gain uh, normalized and divide by the sum of all of them. That's why I am saying that this is unnormalized because it because of priorities and strength, these numbers may not add up to one. If you leave the priorities always at one and the strength also at one, then this will add up to one and the unnormalized and normalized versions are the same. But if you introduce these other features, then you are multiplying by priorities and that is going to allocate more gain to one of the tracks, but it also kind of uh, skews the whole thing and you have to normalize again so that the, all the tracks add up to one. And the fact that all the tracks add up to one is important because then it really means that the auto mixer is doing what it's supposed to, which is to simulate the idea that you have one microphone being shared by multiple people in the room though, in fact, there are multiple microphones open in the room. But the intent of the auto mixer is to pretend that there is only one microphone being shared. So we do here the division of the track RMS by the sum of our RMSs. We multiply by the priority, so that's a very simple way to implement priority. This next line has to do with the strength, this parameter here. So the intent here is that the strength is, if you increase the strength, then louder tracks will be even louder. It, you, it, we will allocate even more gain to them. And if a track is quiet, we are going to allocate even less gain to that track. So we are increasing the strength of the effect. We are making the changes even more drastic, which is useful if you have something like a noisy environment and you want to really separate who is speaking. Or maybe you think that the auto mixer is too heavy handed, you can hear the auto mixer working and switching between tracks, then you can decrease the strength and the auto mixer will do less of the changes between tracks. 
And I think that if you take this strength and, and pull it down, then I don't think that it holds that the gains add up to one anymore, but that's because you are not allowing me to do the work, right? If you take the strength and take it down to zero, then I'm effectively not doing any auto-mixing at all. All the, the sliders are here static. And then I think that the gains still add up to one, but definitely the fact that there is only one microphone being shared in the room is completely gone. Anyway, the way I do this is something that I'm very proud of. I thought about, well, if I have something like 1.7 or this track is contributing 1.7 of the signal, I want this to be even greater. And if the track is contributing something like 0.3, I want this to contribute even less. So I found a function that looks like this. And this is for smoothing, right? So I was thinking about ease in and out. So I was thinking about motion in time. And if you think about this as something like um, some animation in something, like when you scroll, it, it, it scrolls more naturally. It doesn't start scrolling and then stop scrolling code. It has some easing in and out of scrolling. And if you think of this as time and then this as position, you can describe this curve. And I wanted to look for a curve that could be parameterized. And I found one. So I went to the Stack Overflow and I found this formula that gives me um, a straight line when alpha is zero, but as you increase alpha, then it becomes more and more curved. Let's look at this in the grapher. That's how I learned about this and I, I played with it. So this is a tool that allows me to graph formulas. I'm going to copy the formula. So y is equal to x to alpha divided by, or no, not this part, that is divided by, this part is divided by x to alpha plus one minus x to the power alpha. I will also define a variable that will be alpha and I'll start it with one bring this up, but I will animate this so I can create a slider here that allows me to pull this down and go up. And I will change the settings so that the minimum value is zero, the max, or actually I'll do minus two, the maximum value may be one, or actually I'll do two as well. The number of steps, whatever, the continuous range, that's the important part. Now, as I slide this to the left and the right, then it's showing the different values, as you can see here. So when alpha is equal to 1, then you have a straight line. And that means we are not changing the gains at all, because we are multiplying by a value. So if we have something like um, 0 0.3, the output is 0 0.3. This formula is going to not change the inputs or outputs at all. But as we increase the strength, then it becomes more curved. And something like 0 0.8 now turns into, I wonder if I can do this and read out the values. Yeah, so if I have something like 0 0.8, you can see below here becomes 0 0.9. And something like 0 0.2 becomes, yeah, 0 0.1 almost. And when I change alpha, the more I change the alpha, the more it is curved. And the less I change the alpha, the less it's curved. And of course, if I go below one, between zero and one, then this, it goes the other way around. And there is almost no change to the inputs and outputs at all. So all the inputs kind of map to half in this case, which means all the channels here will have more or less the same strength. I am no, I'm no longer affecting the gain that much. And I guess I could even go down to zero and then this would be a straight line. And I could go below and this would be like a negative, a negative strength, which again, you can do in here in Reaper, just come here and say minus one. Now this has negative strength, which means that when you speak, then your gain goes down. And when you stop speaking, then your gain goes up. So you, if you just want to hear noise in the room and not hear the people speaking, that's how you go about it. Anyway, 
that's the formula I'm using here on the strength part of the AutoMixer code. I'm taking the gain as just calculated and prioritized as well. I am doing the strength thing. I am uh, squaring or not squaring. I'm the alpha in the formula becomes the strength parameter. So the parameter that we are sliding here is also the slider that I give you here on the strength parameter. So this strength becomes our alpha. And I, f I think it's super cool to use Grapher like this because we actually have a slider that actually maps to the slider that we end up building in Reaper. Anyway, so that's just a translation of the formula. I'm taking the tracking and normalized and doing the, the strength thing. And then in this part, I do the same thing I did before and I actually store in the arrays and in the sum of all the tracks, I actually store the things I have computed here on top. It's similar to what we did here. First, we compute all the variables, then we accumulate them in the arrays to untangle any kind of dependency that could happen in the variables. Anyway, now let's actually do the, the let's apply the gain. Well, actually, first off, we have to normalize things. So we'll do a bunch of things here in this next loop. Now that we have computed the gains for all the different channels, so by the gain, I mean the slider here, now that we have computed that, we are going to loop over all the tracks again. And this time we are going to do a bunch of things. First, we are going to uh, compute the normalized version of the gains so that the gains add up to one again. So we did a bunch of shenanigans with uh, priorities, with strength. Now we want the, the gains to be add up to one again. So we take the sum, we take the track the, the, the gain for a current track, we divide by the sum, we end up with something that will add up to one again. And then there is a cool trick here, because if you have this disabled bypassed, which is something you may need to do if you want to hear the effect that the auto mixer has in your audio, that's the way you bypass. You cannot bypass here because of the multi-channel track setup we have. We, you would only hear one of the microphones if you bypassed here. So instead you have to use this special bypass thing. And the way this works is we just set the track gain to one. So we did a bunch of work, all this, computing RMS and everything. It all ended up in computing the track gain variable and then you immediately overwrite it. <laughs> and that's how bypassing works. And then I'm also computing this array that is the RMS of the current track times the gain. So if there is some change in the gain, so let's say that I assign this a lower priority, this should go down. No, because there is no signal coming through the other channels. So you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna take one of these other channels and just put a tone generator that competes against my voice. So now there is some information coming through channel two, and that is a constant that is very loud apparently, so I have to bring it down. Just some noise that I have to compete against, I'll bring it down. Now it's a reasonable amount, maybe some more, something like that. Maybe this will make him happy. Okay, this is too much, my voice is not coming through. Okay, something like this. So, oh, perfect. So then there is this constant tone, and when I speak, I can go over the tone. So I did a bunch of work to to, com to compute the gain on the inputs and I multiply by the gain. So I did a bunch of work to compute the RMS of the inputs and I multiply by the gain I have just computed to find out what this right hand sidebar should be. So on the left here, we have a constant and when I stop speaking, it goes up. And that's actually what you're seeing here, this, this gain part. We don't need this in the algorithm for changing the, the audio part, but we need it for the visual part. That's why we compute this. And then after computing everything, we store everything. That's what these two lines are doing. And then I, I, I'm, on this part, I'm actually going to affect the signal. So I'm going to loop, a, loop over every channel of this current track, the number of channels per track. And then I will take the sample of that track, I will apply some gain 
so that the, that's the gain we have so painfully computed and in some cases discarded. So we were going to multiply by this and we are going to zero out that track. So notice how not only this is auto mixing the signal, but it's also muting the other signal. So I'll turn off the auto mixer for a moment by bypassing it really. And then you can see that there is some signal coming through on channel two, but or channels three and four. But I don't want that to happen. I want all the other channels to be silent. So I'm zeroing everything out. And then I'm adding up. Oh, by the way, I, sh I guess I should have explained this. Why do we multiply to apply the gain? We multiply, it's something we kind of covered in that other video about multiple effects as fast as I can. But the idea here is just that if we have a number between zero and one, or really, uh, any number and you multiply, you are making the the valleys and the peaks higher. So you're taking values and you're making them even more drastic. A sample that is like half, if you multiply by two, it becomes one, it becomes really loud. So that's why we multiply to apply the gain. And we add to combine tracks together. Also being, I have covered this in the video about many effects as fast as I can. The idea is that any kind of arithmetic operation translates to some audible result. So multiplying means applying some gain, making things louder or quieter, and adding means let's put all these signals together. We can hear them together. And I'm very, I, I'm very proud of this. This is, has been cleverly done in this order because I am also zeroing out the first channels. So these two channels are also being zeroed out first and then add it up to. So even the first channels work because the thing is in this order. If it was in this order, other way, then you would uh, miss, if it was like this, then you would add up on the first channel and then you would zero it out. That's not what we wanted. So we would need to check if we are on track zero and whatnot. But just because I did it in this order, then it falls out naturally. Very proud of these lines. And then, we are doing some work here to find if we have just gone over the track that is the loudest, because I need to know what the loudest track is to uh, make the video track, the video switching work. So I'm checking, did I just find some tra track gain that is greater than the maximum I currently have, which starts with minus one? Then if so, I will keep track of it. And then later in the code, I'm going to use this in some places. Let's go to the part later in the code where I'm going to use this. <laughs> so what I'm doing in this part is I need to do some debouncing of the, the, the values we compute here. So the maximum can switch very fast. If the two tracks are almost as loud as one, uh, as one another, then it could switch really fast. And in the video, it would just flicker the screen. It would look terrible. So you can see that there is a tiny amount of room between when I stop speaking and it goes to track two. And this is determined by those two variables. We had sliders, the hidden sliders. We had hidden sliders for these variables because of this. And we are using them here. So I'm checking first if the difference between my maximum at this moment, the one I just computed, if the difference between that and the one I had before, so the the track that I had before, so in this case, I, ha I currently am on track one, and then when I stop speaking for a moment, track two will be louder, but I'm checking the difference between track two and track one, because I need the difference to be significant before I make the switch. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm checking the difference between my current maximum and the one that was before, I'm checking if it is smaller than some given difference in amplitude. That's one of the parameters that a user can set. So if the user says that they want a very a large difference, then something needs to be very, uh, it needs to be a lot louder than what was before for it to register. The difference between the signals needs to be loud, which means that if uh, it's not going to switch as fast, it's going to take a while to switch because the difference needs to be very loud. And if some, if multiple people are speaking and someone is, uh, it is already on the camera. So if camera is on person one and multiple people are speaking, the camera is probably going to remain on person one. 
And then there is some debouncing going on here. Debouncing means I don't want the thing to flicker, so I'm first checking if the change is significant. And even if it's not, then I'm resetting the debounce. But if this the difference is significant, then I'm doing some subtraction here on the debounce. And only when the debounce is zero, that I actually do the track switch to the other person. So I'm actually switching from one to two when I do this part. So the debounce is just going to... So it's going to start with a, a given number that was also given by the user. And that is a, is given by the user in milliseconds. I actually convert it to samples. But the debounce is just a number, like 500 samples. So it needs to be, this difference needs to be significant for 500 samples before it registers. So if you have some switches that are significant, but really fast, it doesn't register. If you have changes that are permanent, multiple people are speaking for five seconds, but the difference between the audio tracks is not that loud, it doesn't switch. And that's how I prevent flickering. And I think that by tailoring the res these values the way I did with some test footage, I think I found some parameters that work really well. It looks like the thing that an editor would do by hand. And of course, with the Auto Mixer for video setup, you can always go in and change things. If you feel like the Auto Mixer is not doing the right thing, you can switch to a certain camera for a moment. Like, for instance, when someone is quiet, but they are reacting. They, you want to look at their face, but they're not saying anything. An editor can use the multicam uh, setup that I showed in other videos in this channel to do that switch. Anyway. So that's how this part works. It's doing a debouncing by taking a variable and assigning a high value to it, and then subtracting one for every sample. So this code is running on every sample. If the, ch the change in audio signal is significant for a while, then this variable eventually gets down to zero. That's when we do the update of the track. Note how I'm using GMAM, that's the global memory. Again, the global memory is there for communication between this plugin and the video processor. So I'm actually changing slot zero of that shared memory with the number of the track. That's the only bit of information that this is communicating to the video processor, the number of the track that is currently the loudest. That's the bulk of the plugin because that's doing the actual manipulation of the audio and it's doing the computation for the video processor as well as well as computing every variable that the serialized section, uh, sorry, that the GFX section needs. We are computing all the values in the sample section and we are only displaying values in GFX, so in this section. So there is no, oh, let me compute RMS here. No, that is all done already. Let's start with this section because we already covered serialized. So GFX, first of all, I'm giving you numbers here that are the size of the window that I would like to have. Of course, when I stretch, then it, it moves. That's all right. But to begin with, when you open the plugin, it starts with the size I'm giving here, and or at least it tries to. If the, the window, your, your computer has a big enough screen, then Reaper will try to allocate that space for you. But if um, your screen is too small or whatever, then it may not allocate that. It doesn't guarantee that it's going to allocate that space for you, but it tries. Then I'm setting, so I'm saying that now I want to draw in white. I have some variables here that are magic numbers that I found in the documentation and he wanted to give them meaningful names. So these are the numbers you need to use to centralize text vertically and horizontally. And I want to centralize these numbers here on the bottom. So I assign this to variables, to constants really. Then I have a bunch more of constants that are just the lengths, heights, and the, uh, the measurements of all of these elements here. So I have a bunch of interesting things going on here. First of all, these are flexible. So if you have many more tracks or if your screen is too small, then you can still see some of the tracks because they, they flow, they reflow. And of course you need to, to program that manually. So I have some, a bunch of measurements here that we are going to use later to that effect. So it's not a static grid. And of course you can change the sizes of things just by changing these variables. It's very easy to resize things if you need. Now let's compute the number of columns that fit on the screen. So for instance, in this case, four columns fit. This time three columns fit or two or one. 
Let's calculate this by dividing the width of the screen. Oh, minus a track padding because I don't want the thing to touch the right of the screen or touch the left of the screen. So I have a padding here and I want to, the way I think about this is every one of these blocks has a padding to one of the sides, I guess the left, but I'm, I don't remember for sure. But one of these blocks has a padding to the left. This block has a padding to the left and so on. And then there is a final padding here on the right. So I have to take the care of that here. So I take the width of the screen minus one of these paddings, and then I divide by the th track width, so this width, plus one of the paddings, so maybe the padding on the left, let's say. And then I take the maximum, oh, I take the floor of that, because if there is um, a fraction of a space here, I don't want the, the fourth track here to appear just part of it, so I don't want that to happen, I want to take the floor. If, you could fit three and a half of this. I want you to fit three of these. So I, that's why I take the floor. But if there is no space, not even for one of them, and of course no one would run the plugin like this, but if you did, then this needs to show at least one. So I take the maximum between one and that number. Now let's make this bigger. Oh, and that's interesting. Look at that. If you make things very small, it seems like Reaper changes this so that it becomes one of these knobs. I didn't know that about Reaper. Okay, that's interesting. I don't think anyone uses a plugin like this, but anyway, cool thing. Now let's loop over all the tracks and notice how I'm using a variable that is not named track. And that's because this block of code, GFX, runs simultaneously with this block of code, the sample block that is also using a variable named track. So I call this variable track GFX. And I loop over every variable. I need to compute the position of this um, this track, this block for a, a current track. And the way I do this is by, well, the left, the, the, the X position is my current track, the reminder of the division by the number of columns. So if I have three columns, then actually I think it's more interesting if I do it like this. So if I have two columns, then the reminder of the division between zero and two columns is zero. Between one and two columns is one. Between two and two columns is zero and one and so on. So this gives me the X position. And then the Y position is given by the division of the current uh, track by the number of columns. So this is track zero divided by two that's zero, one divided by two, that's half. But I want to take the floor of that because I don't want to draw things on half of the grid. So I just take the floor, that's zero and zero. And here I have two divided by two, that's one. The floor of that is one. And then three divided by two is one and a half. The floor of that is one as well. That's the X and Y positions, but I also need to compute the actual coordinate here with respect to the grid, the, the the actual drawing area. So I take the X position and multiply by the track padding plus the track width. So the padding is actually on the right, the left. So a padding plus width times X. So if I am, for instance, talking about this guy, this is track X, this tracks X for this one is one. So one times padding plus width puts me about here. That's how I get to this place in the grid. And then I also add a track padding uh, because as I said, the padding is on the left. So I also add one more padding here to get here. So I'm multiplying by that there is a, a track width plus it's uh, padding, that's this part. And then there is one more padding, and that's where I start drawing things for this track. I think it's nice that the, the code kind of looks like it resembles the order in which things happen. So first there is a padding, it's right here, then the track width, that's this track, then the padding, which is this one. Same for the top. And then we also need to compute the right, the meters bottom, this part here, and the track bottom. So we are just using the variables we defined above these ones with the measurements 
and then we are computing. Like the right is the left plus the width, the bottom is the top plus the height, and the bottom of the whole thing is the top plus the whole height. And of course I have this meters bottom here because I will need to draw this label. Then I will put the cursor, the, the drawing cursor at the top uh, or at the bottom left of the meter, so right here, and I will do the drawing of this bar. To do this bar, I want to draw a rectangle, a white rectangle, because this is the color that we said way above, a white rectangle. And I need to compute the height of the rectangle based on the loudness. So I have here the RMS of a given track, and I will do a bunch of mathematics here to compute the height of that track. First, I will have that value for RMS in amplitude. I need to convert that to dB. That's what this part is doing. Then I will compute how much of the bar I want to show because this value will be between minus infinity and, and zero. And I want to show this um, just a certain amount. I don't want to show it from minus infinity, which is infinitely below here on the screen. For these values, I copied the, the metrics we have by default in Reaper when we look at appearance and I think this part, yes. So the VU meters in Reaper by default range from minus 62 dB and 6 dB. So if you have something that is quieter than minus 62 dB, it doesn't show up at all. Like for instance here. So that's what I do. I do the same thing here with these minimum values. It's minus 62. So I'm taking a value that it's like minus 32. I take minus 62 and sub subtract that. And that gives me the amount that needs to show above the bar in dB. And then I multiply that by the height, the maximum height. So if I had something that, oh yeah, forgot about this part. So uh, the thing here on the right. I'm also dividing by the minimum value. Why do I do that? Because then I have a number between zero and one. So this, the most it can be, this part that I'm highlighting, the most it can be is zero. So this minus 62 minus zero, at most it will be minus 62. Dividing by minus 62 gives me one. If the signal is not as loud as zero, then this will be something like minus 30. So minus 62 minus minus 30 is minus 32 divided by minus 62. That will give me a number between zero and one. And then I multiply by the height. So the maximum height of the bar multiplied by one would be the maximum height that you can see. And anything lower than that, this division here, anything lower than that will give you a smaller bar. So that's how I draw the bar. And then I do a similar thing here to draw and just put my cursor on a different position, but I do the same computation to draw this other bar, the one on the right of the slider. And of course, because I'm looping through every track, I am doing that for all the, bo the boxes, all the tracks. Then there is this part here that is drawing this line and the idea here is similar except that I don't need to do the whole computation of um, dB and everything and that's because I'm showing you here a ratio, a number between 0 and 1. That is the ratio we computed, the, the gain we computed above in the, this, uh, the sample part. So I don't need to do a, comp uh, a computation of amplitude to dB because this is not an amplitude. This is not given in dB. This gain is just a proportion, a ratio. So I draw a line that is the height of the meter. So I draw a line from here to there. And then I draw another line. The x, the, the y position of this is determined by the gain. So that's a number between 0 and 1. So when it's 0, it's right here. When it's 1, it's above there. And the x and y positions of everything else is fixed. We are just looking at the left of the track and the meter width times two and a half. So it stays right here in the middle. The meter is bottom for y. And the y here is determined by the gain, as I mentioned. And then the 
X position for this one. It, was, it starts here. I'll show it on this track. It starts here and it draws a line up to plus meter width. So it draws a line up to here. So finally, there are only a couple of things then left to do. I have to draw the track number here. So I go to the right position, given the coordinates above, and I do some something I, we kind of covered in the code review for the multi-channel video processor. But the idea here is just that I have this number that is the track effect. I also add one because I want to think in terms of zero indexed tracks when doing programming, but I want to show them in terms of one-based tracks, um, one-based indexes. And I again, that comes back to what I was talking about before here. Um, the reaction time is a human-friendly name. One, two, three is a human-friendly way of counting. But for programming, it makes more sense to start with zero. So I'm adding up, adding one to the track number before showing this S print F is going to assign to title. So this looks like a parameter, but it's not. It's actually, um, it's a parameter if you think about passing by referencing languages like C and C++, but really this is like a return from S print F. This is the formatted string and it formats a digit. So that's a way of converting a number into a string. And then I check if the track that I'm currently at is the one that is the loudest. Remember, that's the global memory at zero. If I am on the loudest track, then set the color of drawing to red. And in any case, we are going to reset to white right after. So that's how we make this red. And then we draw a string that is the one we just computed, the title. We do the centering of the string, both horizontally and vertically, using the constants defined here. And we look at the track. Uh, the track position so that we draw a box. So we draw a, a bounding box for text between the left and the right, the top and the bottom. And we tell it to center vertically and horizontally. And this way, if you have more than 10 tracks, it will show the numbers one and zero centralized here properly. Um, I guess I can quickly create 10 tracks and show you that. So I'll Quickly create four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Select all of them, come here to the actions menu and run this. Now we have 10 tracks and the number 10 shows up correctly under here. Continuing with that, we set the color to red. We come to the right placing using the coordinates and we draw the string video track. That's it, that's the JS effects. Now let's move on to the video processor if you want to do video uh, auto-mixing. And I guess I, uh, I closed it, but I shouldn't because really what we are looking at is this code. This code for the video processor is so simple that I'm not going to bother with actually instantiating a video processor and dropping it there. You know what, I'm going to because I want you to see that syntax highlighted and I want to actually demonstrate how you would use this. So you could, just instantiate a video processor, paste this in. So this is giving the name that shows up here. This is similar to the line that is a describe line. So this is line is similar to the describe line we saw in the JFX source. I'm not going to find it again. Then I'm going to set the global memory. You know what, I'm going to bring it up again because there are so many parallels that I think it's important to show them. Okay, so here is our video processor. Oh, you cannot see that. Here is our video processor. Here is the code for the JS effect. So this line describe is similar to this line. This line with GMAM is similar to this one right here. And notice how I'm using exactly the same name. So the global memory is shared. And then I blit, which means render the input track. So the track below me given by this number. So if you have, for instance, this is the loudest track, then it will tell the thing to render the video that is right below me. And this is useful if you have items here that are both audio and video, this works just like that. But if you have, so if this audio is both audio and video, that's how we would set it up. But if you have something else, if you have something like this, so to 
three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Select all of them and make them children. And then take this, as it may be easier to do this in the mixer. If I take this effect from the video processor that is living here, I can bring it down to this other track and remove it from here. Now this allows me to do video and audio separately and still the communication between the two plugins will work. One important, one, actually a couple important things about the JS effect, is, well, one of them is, the JS effect works separate from the video processor and you could have multiple of these JS effects if you had multiple groups of people in different rooms. So suppose you have three people in a room um, talking over Zoom with three other people in another room and you want to auto mix these groups separately. You can do that by having multiple instances of the auto mixer. But ultimately it only makes sense to show one of them on the screen. So you have the auto mixer setting only one of the variables. If you wanted to do a setup with multiple cameras in each room and you wanted to do the auto mixing of the cameras separately and maybe have two windows showing the auto mixed versions of the different rooms, you could do that, but you would have to change this variable. And this is actually, a, a, this application is so wild that this is the first time I'm thinking about this, but you could change this global memory location from zero to one, like so. And then anywhere in the code where you see GMEM, you could change this to one as well. And this is of course, super uh, advanced. It's not something that I anticipated. I don't think anyone actually cares about this feature, but you could have multiple auto mixers um, driving multiple instances of the video processor. Okay, so that's what the video processor is doing. That's how it's, it works. It is as simple as just rendering some, uh, some of the tracks. And of course you could have more work here. You could do this as an overlay. You could do this with rounded corners. There is another video in the channel in which I mentioned uh, how to do this and you can combine the approaches. And you can combine this approach with the um, approach of doing multicam in Reaper as well. Go check the other video about that. Okay, so with all that off the way, let's create a bunch of tracks and I'm going to show you the rescript that sets up the tracks. And this is something I created very recently. It is a very simple rescript that does, um, it creates a parent track and does the routing for you. So this is now another language. This is no longer in the language in which you write JS effects, it's Lua. That's the language being used here. So first of all, I want to collect all the tracks that are uh, selected. Those are the ones that are going to be set up for auto mixing. So I'm going to collect all the tracks by going over with the track index, going over the number of tracks minus one, because I am indexing by zero, but Reaper is going to give you the number of tracks. Like for instance, in this case, it will give me the number five because there are five tracks, but I want to loop between zero and four. So I subtract one. And then I insert into this table, the currently selected track on that given index. So now this tracks table has references to all of these tracks. Next, I check if the number of tracks is equal to zero, then you did not select any track. For instance, in this case, I can deselect all the tracks. If I run this, and the way to run this is just by saving, then you see an error, no track selected. And I also return so that the rest of the script doesn't run. Usually return is something that you do in function bodies, but if you do return on top of a script, you can see that there is no function defined here, then it just halts the execution of the whole script. And this is how you show an error message in Reaper. Now, I'm going to find the number of channels on each track. And that is because if I have something like two channels, then I'm going to do the routing one way. If I have 16 channels on each track, I will need to do the routing differently. So I need to find the number of channels. And also if you have a track with two channels, I'll do this, a track with two channels, a track with, let's say four channels. Then for the auto mixer to work, I will need to change all the tracks so that they are now four channels. So that they are the maximum of all 
the children. So that's what we are going to do next. We are going to find out how many tracks we need to set this, how many channels the tracks need to have. So I start with zero, loop over all the tracks and get the maximum between my current value and the number of channels on a given track. This is um, part of the Reaper interface that I don't really like this, but it's a way for you to grab all the different parts of a track. So you can grab the number of channels, whether the track is muted and many other parameters. Just change this name here. And if you want to find out what you can do, you can come here to the API, look for this, and you can see all the special names you have to give. So for instance, if you wanted to know if the thing was muted, you would pass this. But because I want to know the number of channels, I pass that. And that gives me a number. Now, channels per track is the number four. And then I check. Well, then I compute. How many tracks will the parent need? Well, let's look at this. So the maximum number of channels in one of the children is four. That's this one right here. You can check the route that it has four channels. And I have five of these tracks. So each track will need to have four channels. Five times four, 20. So the parent will need to have 20 channels. That's the computation I'm doing here. Number of tracks times the number of channels per track. If I have more than 64, then Reaper doesn't accommodate for that because there is a limit on 64 channels per track. I give you an error, stop execution. Continuing, I'm going to create a parent track. So the parent track will be above everything else. And to do that, I'm going to check what is the index. So that's the track number. In, in this case, I think it's the number right here. So what is the number of the track that is the first one. Remember that in Lua, unlike the JS effects in EEL, Lua starts uh, arrays with one. So this track's array starts with one. So the first track has a given number, like in this case, it's one. I want to subtract one because that will give me the index of the parent, which is going to be the one that I insert. So I'm going to insert a new track at that index. So I'm going to insert a new track above. And then I'm going to get that track by index. And now this is a reference to the actual track we have just created. And then I need to make that track a folder. To make that track a folder, I need to change another one of these values, another one of these magic things related to a track. And this time we are not looking at the number of channels. So we are not passing this, but we are looking at the folder depth. Folder depth is another one of these parameters, like if a track is muted or uh, if it's armed for recording. And the depth is one if the track is a folder, zero if the track is not a folder, and negative numbers if the track is closing a bunch of uh, a, a bunch of folders above it. So, for instance, in this case, this track is uh, depth zero. Now it's depth one. This track is depth minus one because oh, actually I'll do it like this. So now we have, uh, come on, yeah, like that. So now we have a track depth one, track depth zero, track depth minus one because it's closing the parent um, folder, the, the parent, um, yeah, the parent folder track. If we had a track like this, then this is depth one, this is depth zero, this is depth one, and this is depth minus two, because it's not only closed in the folder above it, but that one as well. So that's a folder, uh, that track has depth minus two. That's the weird way that Reaper has to deal with folder tracks. So I am going to look at the, well, first of all, I'm going to set the depth of the parent track to one. That's simple. That makes that parent an actual parent. It makes that a folder track. Then I'm going to look at, on the last track that was selected, I'm going to look at its current value. So if it's a normal track, I'm going to delete all these tracks. So for instance, in this case, with all these tracks selected, my last one is a regular track. Its depth is zero. If it's closing another folder above it, then it is depth of minus one or minus two and minus three and so forth. Well, whatever that is, I'm going to subtract one so that it closes yet another parent. And then I'm going to set that as my current depth. 
for the last track. And so by setting one as the folder depth for the first track, the one we just created, and setting the last track with a folder that is minus one what it was before, we are making that a folder. We are making um, the parent one a folder and every one of the tracks that was selected into one of its children. It's a convoluted way of making parent tracks, I think, but that's how the API works. Now we are going to set the number of channels for the parent with the, val the variable we computed before. So that multiplication we did uh, here. Hang on. Yeah, here. So that multiplication we did here, we are going to set the number of channels for the parent. We are going to loop over all the children and set the number of channels for the children as well. And we are going to create some offsets. So the parent, uh, so when sending, val uh, sending signal to the parent, we can select to which channel in the parent we want to send. So we want to send to channels one and two. In the other one, we want to send to channels three and four and so on and so forth, so that the auto mixer works the way it does. So the way we do that is by, I'm going to test a bunch of things when running this. So I'm going to set this track to four. And you can see that all tracks have two channels, except for the second one I just changed. And they are all sending to parent one and two, but we want to change that programmatically when setting up the auto mixer. So that's what this is doing. It's sending, it's setting the offset. And by the way, if you want to learn more about these variables, uh, these special names, or why you have to pass through here, that is all in the documentation. You have to pass through in this case, because otherwise I think it would be getting the value instead of setting the value, something like that. Anyway, um, the, the, the documentation is kind of weird and it doesn't read all that well, but if you spend enough time and you look at some other people's code, you can figure things out step by step by a lot of trial and error. Okay, so that's now sending the, the signal to the right channels on the parent. And then finally, I just put the effect in the parent and I show the window. I tell it to show the window with the effect. So now let's select all the tracks and save this. So what should have happened here is that now all the tracks are four channels and they are being staggered. So this is sending to five to eight and nine to 12 and so on. Also, the parent should have what well, is now like 16 because I have four tracks that are four channels each and the auto mixer did show up. It is here in the effects for that track. And yeah, so we kind of looked at everything. Yeah, we are, yeah, we are doing the folder thing that is working. You can see now, now the tracks are in a folder. We are doing the number of channels I, I just showed you and the offset and it's doing the plugin instantiation. Whew. And that is it. That's how the auto mixer works. I showed you everything from the JS effects to the um, video processor and also the uh, rescript that sets everything up. I did consult many other uh, effects and uh, other scripts when developing this, the links will be below for all the references. There is already a Reaper uh, rescript to create a folder, for instance. I looked at that when creating my own because it needed to create a folder. So it will be linked below. Oh, and there is one more subtle thing that I want to mention about the way that this design works when compared to the original auto mixer you can find in Repack. The difference is that because I'm doing this multi-channel thing, there is a subtle thing that happens in terms of timing. It means that all the channels are being fed into the parent track simultaneously. And that means that there is no timing issue. In the original design, you had to instantiate one auto mixer instance of the plugin for every track. So they could be running slightly off and they were communicating between themselves using that global memory thing that we looked at. So though that memory could be out of sync just slightly. I don't think you would ever be able to hear that, but it's interesting to note that this architecture that I designed has 
this advantage as well in terms of timing. The link with the description of how all these timing shenanigans work will be in the description below as well if you want to learn more. Anyway, thanks for watching this. It has been long. It is a lot of information, but it is covering kind of a lot of ground. And I hope you have uh, you, you have fun writing these things, and you hope I hope you learned something from watching this video as well. Make sure you subscribe because I will be posting more videos with code reviews and more live programming and whatnot. So make sure you subscribe to the channel, and that's it for now. I see you on the next one. Bye.